So our next speaker um, also is another amazing role model. Um, really excited to hear um, her story today as well. Uh, and many of you know her, uh, Jenny Klein. All right, hi everybody. My name is Jenny Klein, and I am a mucolipidosis type three patient. Um, today, I want to share my story with you. Um, and before I share it, I just want to preface that this is as real as it is raw. And like many of you sitting in this room, I wear many hats. You guys are parents, caregivers, and patient advocates. And I am a patient, a daughter, and I'm also a scientist. And also, like many of you, I suffer from living with a rare disease, mucolipidosis. And I don't just suffer from the physical pain of living with mucolipidosis, but I also suffer from the emotional turmoil that comes with living with a rare disease, like many of you know. I have watched many of my friends pass away over the years. And this has given me a sense of direction and purpose for my life. So I have four of these words up here because these are the words that um, really speak to me and these are the words that define my purpose and my direction and where I'm at in my life. So I really wanna share this story with you. And it comes down to three pivotal points and moments in my life where I can sh absolutely say like, this is what happened and this is what led me to where I am today. So the first one being when I was 21, so I wanna go back in time. I was 21 years old, a typical college girl, living a quote unquote typical college life. It was spring break and my best friends uh, drove down to Michigan, or drove down to North Carolina from Michigan um, to visit me at college. And when the three of us get together, we normally have a spectacular time, but this week felt a little different. There was something in the air, and we knew that this was gonna be a pivotal moment for us. We happened to be at Target, in the hat section to be more specific of Target. They were pushing me in a wheelchair as they were browsing the hats and the sunglasses and I get stopped by a woman dead in my track. She stands in front of my wheelchair, and she's like, honey, why are you in a wheelchair? And you know, I give my typical elevator speech. I have a rare degenerative disease called ML, and I have hip dysplasia, so I can't stand or walk for extended periods of time without being in excruciating pain. And she looks at me, and she responds with, well, can I pray for you? A little kooky, but I was going with the flow, and I was like, sure, yeah, you can pray for me. And boy, did she pray for me. To this day, that is the fiercest prayer I have ever heard. It was 30 minutes of prayer in the hat aisle at Target. I kid you not, 30 minutes. And by the end of that 30 minutes, the three of us were sobbing, like completely sobbing. And we walked away, and that day was a pivotal moment for me because that's when I realized what I was up against with mucolipidosis. Prior to that moment, I was living my life to the best of my ability, and you could say I was in denial. I didn't really set limitations for myself, and I wanted to do the things that everyone else could do, and I refused to say no. Um, and in some sense, that's good. But to be realistic, I'm not the same, I am different, and I can't do everything that everyone else can do. And that is what it is. And so during that period, I would say 21 to 24, I really experienced growth. And I realized exactly what I was facing when it came to mucolipidosis and what these hurdles were gonna look like. And I was asking questions, well, am I gonna be in pain for the rest of my life? Will I be able to have a family? Like, what is this gonna look like? Can I take the trash out? Can I do mundane things? And then at 23, I had my first hip and pelvic reconstruction. 
the second most pivotal moment in my life. And it was, it was hardcore. Um, three weeks into recovery, I broke my pelvis in physical therapy, and my surgeon said, nope, you're on bed rest. And my mom's like, nope, you're on bed rest. So I was on bed rest for four months. Mind you, I was in the senior year of school at NC State, working on my bachelor's degrees in human biology and psychology. And yeah, I was clinically depressed. Who wouldn't be clinically depressed being on bed rest for four months? But at the same time, this was a pivotal moment in my life because I also realized what my direction in life was. I decided that I wanted to provide hope to families and to patients like myself. My surgeon provided me with hope. He gave me hope that I'd be able to live a life free of pain, and he succeeded, and I am not in pain anymore, for the most part. So I was laying in bed, you know, doing my schoolwork, my online classes, and I was like, you know what? I want to practice medicine. I want to be a physician. And that's when I decided at 23. So I went back to school. I applied to graduate school to get a solid science foundation underneath my belt before applying to medical school to embrace that hardcore medical school curriculum. Well, things don't always turn out as we plan. So during graduate school, the third pivotal moment in my life happened. I was on a plane actually flying back from Washington, D.C. with the National MPS Society when we were advocating on Capitol Hill, and I met my now current boss. We started chatting on the plane, and I quickly found out that he was working on MPS. He was doing research on San Filippo. And then I told him exactly what I had, and it was one of those aha moments. He offered me an internship while I was in graduate school, and I was very frank with him. I told him, I don't have any research background. I don't know what I'm doing, and the basis of my wet lab experience was in general chemistry, and then I dissected a pig in anatomy and physiology. <laughs> and he's like, that's okay. We can train you, but I want to see what you can do. So during graduate school, he took a chance on me, and I interned with him for a full year, still with the anticipation of going to medical school. But following graduation, Sean had other plans for me. He offered me a full-time position at Collaborations Pharmaceuticals as a scientist. And since then, I have been busy building out the rare disease pipeline, I have also been very busy learning the comprehensive and very complicated drug development process in the United States and around the globe. There's a lot to learn. I've also mastered probably every single piece of equipment at the Macromolecular Interactions Facility at UNC Chapel Hill, because I run experiments on a weekly basis. But the best part about my job is that I get to develop individualized research plans for families that face rare diseases similar to us. And right now, I am working on several, um, including rare epilepsies, other metabolic disorders, um, disorders of the mitochondria, and some of the glycoproteinoses. So that begs the question, when is the right time for a patient or a family to get involved in the drug development process. Now, coming into this, I had no idea what I was getting myself into in the drug development world, absolutely none. But I quickly learned, and I'm quick on my feet, and I think it's immediately. So now, I have families coming to me when and after they're diagnosed, saying, hey, I don't have a treatment, will you help me? And this is where I sit down and have a very comprehensive one-on-one -on -one with that family and I figure out what their needs are because that's the most important thing. As a researcher, I need to know what's important to the patient and to the family because what my goals are may be different what their goals are. 
And so I say, as soon as possible in the drug development process. Also, once I started doing more and more of these consults, I realized that throughout my journey and throughout these patient and family consults, that what we really need, what rare disease families really need, is someone to like climb this mountain with us, someone to meet us there, see where we're at, and be like, hey, I will help you with this problem, and I will help you overcome this challenge. What do you need from me? And that's really what we're looking for. And I've been so busy helping these rare disease families with an inch closer to a treatment development that I realized, why am I not doing this for mucolipidosis? This is a disease that has really been neglected in the research field for a long time, and there are no treatments. And the one thing that is happening right now is gene therapy, which has been around for a couple of years, and right now the experiments are being conducted in feline models. But I've been doing all of this work for other diseases, and I had an aha moment this past year. Why am I not doing this for mucolipidosis? I have the background, I have the knowledge, I know the experts, what's the issue here? So the past year, I have been reaching out to the experts in the mucolipidosis research field. There are some in Italy, Germany I've been going back and forth with, Greenwood Genetic Center, and then other families from around this country and around the globe, speaking with them, figuring out where the cell lines are, figuring out what animal models we have. And essentially, out of these conversations and out of a roundtable discussion we had at a conference in July, the Mucolipidosis Collaborative Research Network was formed. And we have had now five official calls. And we have nine dedicated families, researchers, physicians, and industry partners and not-for-profit organizations on this network. And it's absolutely incredible and I'm ex so excited to see what we can do with this new group. But really what it comes down to is having growth. During that time in Target, that was a period of growth for me. And then when I had my hip surgery, that was like a sense, that gave me a sense of direction. This is what I'm doing with my life. And then working for Sean, I realized like this is my purpose. And many people in this room will not understand this, but then there are a select few that will. The burden that comes with living when you see your friends passing away. And you ask yourself, well, why me? Why am I still here? And it's because we're still fulfilling our purpose. And so this year has been a hard one for me. I've lost several friends to mucolipidosis. On January 1st, I lost Sidney Zachariah Haggett. He was 18. And on November 1st, I lost Austin Tyler Marine, and he was 21. And these were two guys I have known since I was 12 years old. And so this is really the driving force for me. And this is, this is about family. Being here is about cherishing those small moments and being with our MPS family. And if you've been dragged here by a significant other, if you're industry, if you're a cousin, I don't really care, you're now officially inaugurated into the MPS family as of 2019. Welcome to the party. Um, I hope you like us because now you're stuck with us forever. <laughs>